Welcome back to the introduction to materials. In this video, we're going to take a much more in-depth look at the material editor. We're going to talk about its user interface and how you're going to be working with it to create your materials. Now, at the end of this video, we're going to start putting together our very own material using some textures that actually ship along with UT3 so that you can follow along and do exactly what we do. Let's go ahead and get started. I'm going to begin by opening up the generic browser by clicking on the Open Generic Browser button. And in the last video, you might remember that I save this very simple matte first material uh, material <laughs> and if you double click on that you open up the material editor now I am very limited on screen space hopefully you're running this at a higher resolution than I am I'm running at 1024 and you should probably be running at 1280 at the very least if you're using Unreal Ed but I'm gonna go ahead and expand this out and let's take just a moment and look at the user interface for a material editor and let's get some general areas identified first off we have a very simple menu bar with only a single menu we have a toolbar across the top we have have the preview window where we can see the result of our uh, our material on some sort of an object and we'll talk about this object and how you can uh, not only manipulate it but you can manipulate the lighting in this window and you can change what object you're looking at we'll talk more about that in just a few minutes uh, next to this we have the material expression graph this is where the magic of your material actually takes place it's where you will go in and create a series of material expressions which I will be calling nodes throughout this uh, video and others you'll be linking these together performing actions on them and then connecting them into your main material node this is a kind of like the central nervous system the brain if you will of your material now to the right of this we have our material expressions list this lists off all of the various material expression nodes that you can create and uh, use to create your various materials and down here at the bottom we have a properties window which is really no different than any other properties section available inside of many of unreal ed's uh, various editor windows including like the the uh, object properties or actor properties window which I'm sure you've seen a lot by now now this user interface is very customizable if you need to make any changes to it they're real easy to do a lot of these uh, various sections you'll see have little name tags like here we have preview and then colon tells us what we're previewing if you uh, take a look you have a little X button on these so you can close these out and they disappear which will scare you at first uh, how do I get that back come up here to your window menu and you'll notice that that's no longer checked we can bring it right back you can also drag these around a new location so if I click on this top bar and start dragging around I can reposition it uh, right here next to the uh, properties window if I want to I can put it up on the very top if I want to or if I drag it out entirely I can make it an, an entirely separate window unto itself or redock it so see I can move it around and it's being a little bit picky now because it thinks I want to redock it so you have to find a location where you're not using much screen space this is very handy if you're using a multiple monitor setup because you can take this window and just drag it over on your other monitor have a lot of uh, real estate space to be working with your material Material, and then just go over here and check out your preview whenever you want to. And then, of course, you can redock it or just close it and uh, bring it back like so. So let's go ahead and just drag it right back over here. And then I'll put it to the left very carefully of my uh, material expression graph. Now, uh, again, any one of these panels that has a little name tag, uh, include, uh, this auto save popped up again. We have the uh, material expressions. You'll know th notice that this can do the same thing. We can completely undock this if you want to have this as a separate list. So, uh, I mean, I'm not going to do that with everything, but just to kind of show you the general idea here, uh, if you want to really customize this editor, you can do that. So, enough of that. Let's take a look at the individual components of the material editor's user interface. Again, starting off with this uh, menu at the top, you already kind of saw what it does. It allows you to show or hide other uh, key areas that we've already discussed. That's really the only reason that that menu is even there. Frankly, I think you could have done it with some toolbar buttons, but you know, that's just me. I like toolbar buttons. They make me feel good. So, uh, over here uh, underneath this, we have the main toolbar. Let's take a look at all the various buttons that you have access to. First, we have Home. This will focus the material node, which is this uh, big guy that you see here with the big long list of various things. Uh, we'll talk about what those things are in a later video, but we'll focus this in the upper left-hand corner. So if you get lost, maybe you're dragging around, uh, you can just click on this, and boom, it'll take you right back so you can see your material node. Uh, if you don't know how to navigate this yet, I'm sure you can figure it out while I'm talking about it, but we'll talk about navigating this here in just a moment. 
Next to this, we have the toggle grid button. And I've got to come over here to the preview window and give us a nice shot of the grid. You see, I can turn that on and off. It's just a way for you to get an idea of what's up, what's down, and, you know, that sort of thing to orient you in the 3D space of the preview window. Generally, I leave it on, but sometimes if I've got a transparent material, it can kind of uh, get in the way. Or actually, sometimes it can also be beneficial. If, you're, if you have a material that is distorting in some way, like uh, doing pseudo-refraction, you can turn this on and you can actually see the extent of your refraction because you'll be refracting the grid behind you. Pretty handy. Now, the next three buttons are uh, used to change out the primitive that is showing inside the preview window. By default, uh, this will be set to a sphere. Some of the materials that you open up that ship with UT3 will have this set to something else. Uh, some of them will even have a customized static mesh. But uh, let's go ahead and just click on some of these. You can click and set this to a cylinder, to a box or a cube, and then a sphere. And there's also a button for using a specific static mesh that you have already selected inside the generic browser. So if I had one selected, I could just click on that, and it would apply it like so. Now, uh, next to this, we have a little skull icon. It says clean unused expressions, and here's what that does. Let me grab any old expression. Let's just say a sign, and it's floating out here in space, and you'll notice it's not connected to anything. We'll also make a rotator, and it doesn't matter. If you want to follow along with me, you can create anything you want. I'm just creating some random nodes that aren't, aren't really doing anything and aren't connected into the network in any way. As soon as I click the uh, clean unused expressions button, those are immediately erased. It just gets rid of any nodes that you have just floating there, which are taking up space for no reason whatsoever. All right, next to this, we have the uh, Show Hide Unused Connectors button. This is kind of cool, but it'll scare you if you don't know about it and if you forget it. So if you toggle this, you'll notice your material node changes shape dramatically. But it's more than just your material node. Let me turn it back off, and I'll grab something that's got a few more uh, connections to it. I'm going to grab a vector parameter node, and I'll just drag this in like so. So you'll notice this guy's got a lot of connectors. Uh, just kind of hanging out there, and we'll plug him into specularity, which isn't going to make a change. I'll talk more about that a little bit later. But as soon as I uh, hide this, any connection that we're not using is going to disappear. It's a way to make your material... Uh, expression graph look a little bit neater, but it can also be a little bit of a pain because you might still be editing and you might you know, need those plugs. So really, this is the only the kind of thing that I would really only use if I was completely done with my material and didn't want to make any more changes to it. Next to this, we have toggle curved connections. This is, I don't know, more aesthetic than it is anything else in my opinion, but you can turn these on and off. Me, I kind of like having my uh, wires be nice and curvy. As I drag this around, you'll notice we get this nice S-curve connection here, but if I turn that off, we get straight lines. That's really all that does. So it's whichever you prefer. Again, I like the, the curvy spline shape, but you do whichever one you want. Now, uh, next to this, we have some toggle real-time buttons. The first one is toggle real-time material viewport. So if I switch this on, the uh, material viewport over here uh, in, uh, for the uh, material preview is going to become real-time. Now, this isn't going to show us anything in this particular case because we have a material which isn't animated. But later on in a few videos, we're going to have a material which is animated. And if we want to see that feedback immediately, if we want to see it just kind of animate on its own so we can watch what it's doing, we would toggle the real-time material viewport. Now, next to this, we can toggle a real-time expression viewport. And what this will do is take any animated uh, material nodes that we have here, and we'll actually be able to see the animation within the nodes themselves. So pretty handy. And then next to this, we have toggle expression uh, real-time preview. This will take everything and make it real-time all the time. And if we turn this on and off, something's going to happen. Watch these nodes really closely, and just keep your eyes on those while I toggle this off. Did you see what changed? We have this little tiny box up here in the top of each one of these. And uh, though it is something I could discuss a little bit later, let me get it out of the way. Otherwise, I will probably forget. This is a real-time button that uh, can be activated for each individual material expression. So if you have a panner or some sort of animation applied uh, throughout one of your networks and you want to see the result of that, you can click on, click on this little button and now this node is showing up uh, in real time. Any changes that are taking place over time will update even if we're not doing anything. You'll just be able to sit here and watch those changes. You can do that on a node by node basis or if you just want to do it for everybody, you can toggle the real time expression viewport or just toggle everything real time, which is generally how I work. And if you happen to be working down on the properties paying for the select 
product and material expression, you can also click on the Be Real-Time Preview, and that's the same thing as clicking on that little box. That's right, except it's got a really cool tool tip that will <laughs> yes, help you does. out if you get stuck. Now, next to this, we have three check boxes, and one of these is really easy, and two of them are a little more complex, but unfortunately, they all have the exact same icon, so things get kind of interesting. Now, the one that you're going to be using more often than anything is the very first far-left check box icon, and that is Apply Changes to Original Material and Use It in the World. And you probably actually saw us use this in the last video, and if you didn't, you just weren't paying attention to the video. If you make any changes to this material, and uh, for just a moment, let's go ahead and kind of shrink this down. I'm going to push it out of the way. I have so little screen space, but I'm going to try to make the most of everything I've got. Uh, let's go ahead and grab, say, the floor. I don't know why, but I'm just picking on the floor right now. And we will apply this material to the floor. And then let's make a change to our material. Let's say grab our uh, little uh, three vector, and we'll change red to, I don't know, 0.2. We're going to change green to uh, 0.8. And uh, we'll say blue, we will set to 0.4, which will probably give me a really funky color, but, you know, it's just the first thing that came to mind. Almost like that um, radium indiglo color that uh, you sometimes see on watches. But if we come over here into our level, the floor is still red. Nothing has changed. If we open up the uh, generic browser, over here our material is still red. Nothing has changed. This first checkbox is kind of like your update. This is where you save your changes to the material and where you apply your changes to the world. So what I'm going to do is try to take the, the generic browser, and we'll shrink it down so it's kind of small. We're going to push our material editor out of the way so we can still kind of see the floor. And then I'm going to click on this, and I want you to watch our material swatch here inside the generic browser and also watch the floor. So give it a second, and boom, everything updates. So now the material has been saved. The floor is now different, so our level has actually changed uh, to uh, accommodate our new changes. And we're ready to go. So that's what that first button does. And notice that now that no changes have been made, this is grayed out. We can't click it again. Anytime you change something within your material, this button will become active again. And I suggest that you get really used to clicking on this a lot. But clicking on this node is only half the battle. That is because occasionally... Not to point fingers, not to, to say anything is wrong. Occasionally, Unreal Ed will get unstable, especially if you're doing something really technical. I mean, perhaps you're uh, building a very hardcore material and you've got Photoshop open because you're editing textures for that material. Who knows? You could be doing anything on your computer. And uh, certain applications might crash, including Unreal. And if uh, Unreal were to crash right now, we would lose this material because we haven't saved our package. Notice down here on my package, we still have that little asterisk next to the package name. If, we w if this change that we have made is important to us in any way, we need to get out of the material editor for a moment, pop back over to the generic browser, and make sure to go to File, Save, and commit those changes permanently. Now it doesn't matter if Unreal Ed closes on us because this material is locked down. It's finalized. So just keep in mind that uh, clicking on this little checkbox is only half of the battle. All right, now we get to the other two checkboxes. And I'm not going to get into a big, long lecture about these because what they do is just a little bit technical. Unreal Engine 3 is uh, capable of running on older video cards that support Shader Model 2. What this rightmost checkbox is going to do is check your material to see if it will run on Shader Model 2. If it can't for some reason, which would mean you have a whole lot of material expressions in there, uh, which lead to a lot of mathematical instructions inside the shader, uh, there are other factors as well, but I'm not going to turn this into a GPU lesson. Or uh, just features that simply are not supported by Shader Model 2. Exactly. So, I mean, if you go beyond the bounds of Shader Model 2, what uh, is going to happen is that internally, when you try to play the game, Unreal is going to start switching off various channels. I believe it's going to start with Specular, and then it'll go to the normal map, and then it's going to go to Diffuse. Use, then it'll go to emissive. Now, if that doesn't mean anything to you, don't worry about it right now. If it does mean uh, something to you, well, very good for you. Well, the bottom line is it's just going to shut one of these off and see if it's going to successfully yeah. compile. It'll keep checking. It'll say, if I switch this off, w is it now uh, functional for Shader Model 2? No. Okay, I'll switch this off. Now is it functional for Shader Model 2? And so on and so forth. It'll just continue switching things off until it can finally get something that will successfully compile to Shader Model 2. The problem with that is if it shuts off uh, all four of those channels, your material is going to look like nothing, or it's going to look terrible. It will not look like what you want. And in those cases, you need to create a fallback material. And a fallback material is really nothing more than a simplified version of your material that is qualified to run on a Shader Model 2 graphics card. 
That's all there is to it. And you can assign a fallback material here inside of our material node. So if I needed a simpler version of this material, which of course I don't, but if I needed one, I could create one and I could assign it right here. That's actually where this second checkbox comes into place, the middle one. What this does is this will create a fallback material for you, and it will assign it uh, to this section. You won't see the change. You'll actually have to close and reopen the material editor to see the change, but it will go ahead and assign it into place. And then what you'll have to do is close out the material editor, open up the new fallback material that was created, and you're going to have to start simplifying things and clicking this last checkbox icon over and over until finally you don't receive an error message anymore. At that point, you have a successful fallback material that will work on Shader Model 2. Now, that was really technical and a lot further than I really wanted to take this, but I wanted to make sure there weren't too many questions about what those last checkboxes do. So it's for backwards compatibility. There you go. I could have said that, I guess, and we could have just moved <laughs> right on. This is for backwards compatibility. Moving on. All right, so uh, down under underneath here, we have the preview window. Now, this has fairly simple navigation, which you're probably already used to on some level, but if you're not, uh, let's go ahead and talk about it. If you drag with the left mouse button, you are tumbling around whatever your central primitive happens to be. In this case, it's a sphere. If we right mouse drag, we are dollying in and out. Uh, I like to call it dollying. You can call it zooming if you want to, but we're actually trucking the camera in and out of the scene, so uh, however you want to call that. So uh, the thing gets bigger and it gets smaller. That's the important thing. And really, those are the only two functions you need because you, you might want to get right up on your material and see all the little cracks and crevices you've created or just rotate around and see how things are looking. Another function of the uh, preview window is the ability to change the lighting that is uh, visible. If I hold the L key on my keyboard and move my mouse around in here, I am moving the position of the light which, you know, on a sphere in general doesn't really mean that all that much because you could always just rotate around to another angle. But uh, if you are anywhere else, like maybe you have a, a static mesh in here, like a, a character mesh or I don't know, it could be anything, and you need to light it from another angle, just hold the L key, and you'll notice I'm way over here. My cursor is actually in the middle of the uh, material editor. I can drag around anywhere. I'm not limited to just keeping my mouse here inside the preview window. So I can put the light directly above us, directly below, or rotate it all the way around. So I'm just dragging constantly to the right. I'm picking up my mouse and dragging over and over again, and we're just rotating that around like a beacon light. So that's pretty handy, but that's really all there is to the uh, preview window, also with the ability to switch the grid on and off, which I already showed you. Okay, I'm going to skip this big window for just a second. I'm going to jump all the way across the UI and talk a little bit about the material expressions list. As I mentioned earlier, this is just a list of all of the various material expressions that you have available to create your material. And we've already used one. We used a constant three vector. And uh, if you wanted to... Uh I won't do it. I was tempted to go ahead and start dragging some in and doing stuff, but we'll save that. I'll refrain, but you can create uh, other material expressions from this list as easy as just clicking and dragging out into your material expression graph. It's very simple. If you need to remove those, of course, just select them and hit delete. So that's all there is to that, but uh, the material expression list is certainly not the only way to create material expressions. If you close this, it's not like you can't create any more material expressions. Far from it, actually. You have the ability to create everything you could a second ago if you right-click here inside the material expression graph. So if I right-click here in an open area, I get the exact same list. Now, granted, this is probably going outside the capture area, but there's a little tiny black arrow at the bottom of this list. You're going to see if you actually do this on your end. You'll see it at the top as well. Yeah, and I can use this to just scroll down the list. And there's all sorts of various things I can add. And there's a couple of other things, too. I have the ability to add in comments, which we will discuss later, and the ability to paste. And I'll talk about that later as well once we actually get into creating a material. Now, with that, let me go ahead and bring back the material expression uh, window, or panel, if you. Now, uh, let's move on to the material expression graph. This is, as I said earlier, where all the magic of your material takes place. You're going to be combining a whole bunch of various material expressions, uh, some that just include texture, uh, texture information in the form of bitmaps. You will be multiplying that, adding it, subtracting it, assigning other things such as pixel depth. There's so many different things you could do, and we'll cover some of those, just a few of those, as you proceed through these videos. Aside from that, I highly recommend you come in here and just try experimenting experimenting after you go through these videos and see how to begin. Now, uh, to navigate inside this window, simply left mouse drag and you can pan around. If you uh, hold left and right mouse and move up and down, so I'm moving up now and I'm zooming out, which is very useful if you start to get a really big network in place, and then you can zoom in 
as well. So it becomes really intuitive once you get the hang of it. Also remember that you have that home button up here in the, the corner to home you in on wherever your uh, material node is. Now notice, though, that that doesn't zoom you all the way back in. So if you stay really far zoomed out and you get lost, it's really easy to forget where you are. So you're like, I'm having a hard time. There it is. Uh, I, I did get lucky in that case. But you can get lost. So remember that home button. It'll bring you in, but you may need to zoom back in. So what I would do is I would hold down left and right mouse. I would drag down several times to make sure I was zoomed all the way in then click home, and then you can't go wrong. Okay, so that takes care of navigation. Now let's talk about a few other things. The primary material node, your main material node, you can't really do anything with that. It has a constant position. You can navigate around it, but we can't. you'll notice we can't select it. It never becomes highlighted. It's always just going to kind of be there. It's the unstoppable force. Now, your other material expressions, your other nodes, can be moved around. And to do that, you just hold down the control key and drag these guys around. And that's very common in a lot of the editors available inside of Unreal Ed. If you're just dragging without holding control, it thinks that you want to navigate. So make sure you, you do hold control if you want to move these around. Unlike Unreal Ed's primary, uh, user interface, holding alt and dragging does not allow you to duplicate. If you want to duplicate a node, you need to hit control C, control V for paste or copy paste, just like uh, so many applications in the Windows world. So very easy to do. And then we could uh, maybe change the color of this to uh, 1, 1, 1. So we'll set it all the way to white. And just for whatever reason, I'll plug this into specular. And suddenly we get a specular highlight. And we just change the entire nature of our material. It now looks like uh, some sort of teal plastic instead of uh, sort of a flat, chalky material. So there's a quick look at that. And I think that's really everything you need to know about the expression window, except for maybe one thing, and that is that there are a lot of hotkeys in here for the creation of various nodes. And I'll be going over some of these as we progress through material creation. But uh, let's see, for example, if I want to create another one of these three vectors, I don't have to copy one that already exists. I can hold down the three key and left click and it'll make one for me. Uh, if I want to make a multiply node, which is something we'll be using a little bit later, I can hold down the M key. Uh, M is in Michael, and I click, and... Oh, I'm sorry, that's not the M key. That's actually the N key. How embarrassing. So hold down the M key, and there you go. But you did see that by holding the N key for November, I got the uh, normalized node. So a lot of these various nodes in here have uh, hotkeys that you can use. And again, I'll be showing you some of those as we progress through. All right, now down underneath here, we have the properties area. And this, uh, this area is going to change depending on what you have selected. You'll notice if I have a three vector selected, we get the RGB values for that vector. We get a real-time preview checkbox. And then we get a description. And uh, description is something we'll use a little bit down the road. I won't worry about it right now. If we select the main uh, actual material node, we have a big, long, impressive list of properties. And I'm not going to go over each and every one of those, but I will bring a few of them up. First off, we have blend mode. This is going to handle how this uh, particular material is going to deal with its environment. Uh, is it opaque, meaning uh, you cannot see through it? Is it masked? This basically means, does it have some sort of uh, direct opacity mask, which will make it uh, invisible in some spots? Now, I'll talk more about that and exactly how it works once we start going through the material channels, so that it's not the time yet. Uh, you can have a translucent material, which can have varying uh, gradations of transparency, so it can be partially transparent. We have additive, where it's actually going to add its color to whatever it is behind it, and we have modulate. So, uh, th again, that's just kind of dealing with how this material is going to look in the terms of its environment. Underneath this, we have the lighting model, and this controls how, this, how the surface of this material will deal with light. First off, we have the Fong lighting model, which if you have any experience with a 3D animation package, you might have already seen this. It's a very common algorithm for controlling uh, how light reflects off of surfaces. It was actually developed by a dude named Fong. <laughs> but uh, underneath this, we have non-directional. We have unlit, so if we select that, we get no lighting on this whatsoever, meaning if we want to see color, we have to plug into the emissive channel, which actually fakes the emission of light. Just uh, kind of generally going over that. And uh, we have the... Oops, uh, Autosave. We have the custom uh, lighting function, and uh, this is if you want to create your very own lighting model outside of Fong. Like maybe you know of a better one, like an anisotropic shader. You can actually create a series of material expressions to drive that and plug those into the uh, custom lighting channel and just set over to custom like so, and there you go. Now, uh, again, that's kind of a general overview because it's not something that I'm going to really... Uh, 
break out into Lectron. I'm just kind of walking you around the interface. You have some other things as well. You have a wireframe. So if you just want to see the wireframe of the material, or it will be a wireframe material in and of itself. This is useful if you want to see the wireframe of a model inside your game, because you can see the material is still green. It's still got a white specular highlight. But what you're actually looking at is the wireframe uh, information, which is very cool. Is it two-sided, meaning you could see the back side of it, which doesn't do us any good in this particular case. But if we had some sort of a texture that was making this uh, transparent in some spots, do we want to be able to see the back side of the object? By default, you can't. If you check this on, you can. Uh, of course, we have the fallback material, which you can assign here. And there are a series of other properties that we don't necessarily need to get into in an introductory lesson, besides most of them are fairly self-explanatory. You know, is this material used with fog volume? Is it used with beam trails and so on and so forth? So that is a general overview of the material editor's user interface. Now from here, let's take a look at actually building our very own material. So what I'm going to do is close this out. And notice I didn't hit my apply changes button. And so we get a little warning. Would you like to apply changes to this material, uh, to the original material? If you click no, you'll lose all your changes. Oh, sure. Let's go ahead and do it. So we click yes. Give it a second to save. And that's the equivalent of checking the little, gr the first green checkbox and then closing out the uh, material editor. It's like you'll notice now that we have specularity going on both the material swatch and down on the floor. That's well. right. Our, our floor is a little shiny now. Mm -hmm. It looks uh, kind of wax. Actually, Actually, uh, I remember there was a roller skating rink I know of as a kid that looked a lot like that. <laughs> Anyways, so uh, jumping in here, let's go ahead and create a new material. I'm going to right-click, and if you want to follow along and create your own material, I encourage you to do so, because I'm going to be using textures that are actually included with UT3, so there's no reason you can't follow along. Let's right-click and choose New Material, and I'll leave this in the Zax Materials package. Of course, if you want to uh, give it another name, you know, Zax Materials is a pretty good name. But if you want to name it something else, please, by all means, go ahead. I will put this in the Materials group, and we're going to call this Matt underscore um, Zach Rocks. And not that I rock. There, We're actually going to make a rock material. So That's, that's just, right. That didn't work. <laughs> so uh, let me go ahead and just close this for now. Uh, so when you close this, you'll notice we get this very basic-looking material. In fact, it looks a lot like the default material, which is applied to your surfaces. However, if we double-click and open it up, it's anything but. It's just jet black. Now, the first thing I want to do is bring in some textures. Back in the day, back in earlier versions of uh, the Unreal Engine, such as uh, Unreal 2 when you were using Unreal Tournament 2003 and 4, you would simply take a texture and apply it to most surfaces. You didn't really have to create materials. Now, you could. There was a material system in there, but it was nowhere near as intuitive as what we have now. In these days, inside of Unreal Engine 3, you have to use materials. You are forced to, but if you want some sort of a texture, you need to bring it in in the form of a material expression. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to scroll down in my material expression list. I'm going to bring in a texture sample material expression. Just left drag that in like so. Now, this material expression really is just here to hold some sort of a texture. We need to assign a texture to it, though. Currently, it has nothing in it. Let's go ahead and click over here on the, the None section, and we have a couple of new buttons that appear. We have Use Current Selection in Browser, and we have the Show Generic Browser button. You will see these buttons all throughout the editor, so get used to them. Let's go ahead and click on Show Generic Browser, and I'm going to pull these out of an existing package. So under my Generic Browser, we'll go to File, Open. And underneath the Environments folder, I'm going to dig down underneath, uh, what do we have, ASC Walls Stone, and we'll go ahead and click Open. Now, we opened this up earlier, I believe, in an earlier video, and right now, all I see are materials. It doesn't look like I have any textures. If you see something like this, or maybe you see nothing at all, I don't know, make sure you come over here to your list and show all resource types, or at the very least, come down and just switch on Texture. So what I'm going to do is I'll just go ahead and show everything so we can scroll through. And we have uh, some static meshes in here just to kind of show you what's in this package. But eventually we get down to some textures. And if I make this nice and big, okay, it's not going to really help us too much. But first off, we have uh, TASC Walls BSP Stone 01 underscore D. That's a nice long descriptive name. You'll notice it's 2048 by 2048, fairly large texture. But with that selected, and uh, let me scroll back down, you'll know it's selected because it's got the green highlighting on it. Let's close this, and we'll click uh, Use Current Selection in Browser, and there we go. If you look really close, you can see that that texture has now been applied. Now, what I'm going to do is connect this over here to the Diffuse channel, and I'm not going to talk about each one of these channels in this video. Uh, we'll save that for uh, the next video, but right now, if we connect this over to Diffuse, which is synonymous with your basic color, you'll notice that our material suddenly gets a lot more visually interesting. 
Suddenly we can see rocks. We can see what appears to be some sort of moss growing in between the rocks. But it's not... It doesn't have that oomph. It doesn't have that push. Right now, it just looks like a nice texture applied to a sphere. This looks so Unreal Engine 2. <laughs> we need to make it look Unreal Engine 3. And to do that, we need to add some depth to it. And we're going to do that by bringing in a normal map. Now, bringing in a normal map, it's really just another kind of texture. You might have heard the term because uh, the you know nor normal maps have been talked about a lot in gaming. You might have never heard about it before. But really, in general, all it is is a texture that contains depth information. That's the simplest way to describe it. Now, uh, what we need is another texture sample node. I could grab this one and hit Control-C, Control-V. I could right-click here and choose it out of my list by scrolling down. What I'm going to do is hold down the T key and left mouse click, and I get a new texture sample. But notice something. It comes in with that same wall stone texture we had a second ago. Why is that? Well, it's actually a cool shortcut feature. Any texture that is selected inside the generic browser will automatically be placed inside your texture sample when you create them. That's cool, but it doesn't help us in this case. What I'm going to do is show the generic browser again. We'll click on the ASC walls, BSP stone, underscore in, which is for normal, and then we'll close that, and we will click use selection in browser. So we get this really cool normal map, and all we're going to do is connect it over to the normal channel. Now notice something real quick. I don't before I move too far away, we'll jump over here to the preview window and we just got a, a bit of depth added. And if you didn't see it get added, disconnect by holding down the alt key and clicking on our, our, our little um, output there. And you'll notice again, we get a very flat looking material. As soon as I reconnect that, boom, we get some shading taking place under the rocks. So we get some depth added. And if you want to really drive that home, hold down the L key and start moving your lighting around. And you can really see how those rocks now look no longer flat at all. Now, real quick, before I jump away from this, you'll notice that I used the uh, black connector that is at the top of our texture sample. That is the RGBA channel. That means we're using the red, the green, the blue, and the alpha. We're combining all that together and we're plugging it in. Actually, in essence, we're really only using RGB. Alpha is just kind of its own deal, so I guess I shouldn't mislead anybody. The three primaries, literally, are, are what we're actually putting together and plugging in over here. So we're doing the same thing down here. If for some reason we just wanted the red information, we could plug that in. And this messes with some people because this is not red. <laughs> This is not, uh, when you just use the red channel, you're not just saying, I want the color red to be applied. You're saying, I want the amount of red that is in this texture to be applied. And this amount is set on a 0 to 1 basis, which means, for, or actually 0 to 255, depending on how you look at it. Uh, but that is between black and white, essentially. So if we plug in blue, because it doesn't look like this would have a whole lot of blue in it, we should get a much darker image. Oh, okay, a bit darker. And then we can try green as well. But the key there is that they're all black and white. If you try alpha and you get something like here, you'll notice everything turns white. That essentially means we have no alpha. So we have a, a plain Jane, no special thing with the alpha channel kind of texture. So let's take our RGB channel and we'll just plug that right in. Think like so. So that's all I really want to do with this material so far. I mean, we've got something pretty basic. Let's go ahead and save our, uh, our changes. We'll apply changes to the original. And now you see why I called it Zach Rocks. It wasn't a statement. It was actually a description. And let's go ahead and close this out, and we'll go back into the generic browser and scroll all the way down to our Zach Materials package and make sure that we see everything. Sometimes if you uh, change a package and your, uh, your generic browser looks empty, just click over here in a blank area of the browser. That's all I needed to do, and it redrew everything so suddenly I could see my uh, Zach Rocks material. Now, we see our little asterisk, so make a point to go to File, save that package, because you don't want to lose this. Right. Then let's go ahead and apply that to the floor. Yep, I'll, I'll lose the really nice green we had on the floor. I'll click on Matt Zach Rocks, and there we go. So we got some rocks on the floor. Now, there are a great many rocks. We might want these rocks to be a little bit bigger. We'll talk about ways to handle that, both in the material and on the surface, in an, uh, an upcoming video. But I think that's going to take care of everything I wanted to cover in this video. So that's going to wrap things up. Thanks a lot.